You also had some, we've had a lot of storms in the past week around. I'm thankful that at least here it's not been too bad, but we've had a lot of brethren affected in Oklahoma and northern areas, so need to remember them. Would you please bow with me in prayer before we begin our class? Our great God and Father in heaven, we're so blessed you take care of us in every way. You've provided for our needs. You have given us your long suffering, your care, your mercy, and grace, and extended your love to us in Jesus. And for this, we know we can never repay you, that we are ever thankful. We thank you for the church, that we can come together and to be strengthened, to be reminded of the faith of others, and that we might strengthen our own faith, that we might tell the world of all that you've done, and to be greater examples to them and for their benefit, as well as in drawing closer to you. We do pray, Father, for those who've been affected by these storms, both by the, the winds and the flooding. We know, Father, that this is a can be a difficult time, but we're thankful to be reminded as well that the things that happen upon this earth are temporary and that our relationship with you can be eternal. We pray that you'll bless us as we study. We pray for all of our brethren who are away from us, that you'll keep them safe as they travel. And please bless us, Father, as your people here in our work, that it might go forward and that souls would be saved as a result, that we can look forward in hope with the work that we do to, to be more and more in line with your word and your will. Please forgive us of our sins, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Everyone, please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to begin here, we aren't going to end here. But it is important for some context today. Second Samuel is largely the account of David's reign. It picks up following the death of Saul and then shows the early struggles that he had uh, with Saul's son uh, and the time of uh, brief civil war that occurred when David reigned in Hebron. And then when he finally solidified his control and moved into Jerusalem, we find him then moving the ark there as well. He, he builds his uh, palace there. Everything is going well. And of course, then we find that he commits sin with Bathsheba and everything changes uh, for him. Now, the timeline on this, we need to keep in mind and, and there's some things even here in the chapter that, that are important to note uh, because there's a, there's a problem in the text that we just need to be aware of. But essentially, we've gone through reign, and David reigned for 40 years. So we're talking about a whole generation. And during this time, he has a family during his time even away, and so they're growing up. But family is always his problem both with his children and due to the, the multiple wives and then how he treats his children and they treat him. And that's what we find when we get to 2 Samuel 15, after all these other things have happened. And I just want to read a little bit to get a, a feel for what's going on, beginning in verse 1. After this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate, so it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. And so it was, whenever anyone would come near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. 
Now, it came to pass after 40 years, and that, of course, cannot be 40 years. So, in Hebrew, they put lines above the numbers to show, essentially, what we do is decimals and zeros. And so, what we, we would take this is to be four years. So, after the four years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt at Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city, from Gil- Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. Now, if you want to find a great plan for how to conduct a conspiracy, you have it right here. It's got all the elements of a good conspiracy of how you pull this off, and people do this. You, you would recognize this going on in politics uh, around the world, uh, but this kind of format is pretty, pretty normal for how you would do that. And so the important thing is to understand you have Absalom forming, forming this conspiracy, pulling away, and that word at the end which says the numbers increased. Now, when this happens, and we're going to skip ahead, David then makes the decision when all of this went forward to leave Jerusalem, which is interesting in and of itself. He recognizes the political situation. We've got Absalom down in Hebron. We have David at Jerusalem in the capital. Why would he leave? He realizes the situation is unstable, that he's not in a good situation to protect himself, and that the numbers are not on his side, and so he leaves. So he then takes a group, and there are this group of people that are loyal to him, and he goes out and essentially goes back like what he did under Saul, and he's on the run. So he's leaving, and this is going to be hard because he's got whole family with him, he's got friends, and this is a hard trek. He's older now, he's going out of the city to uh, get away from what he is sure to be an attack coming. So then we find in verse 30, so David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives, that's interesting itself, and wept as he went up, and he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went. And then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Trusted conspirator, now a trusted man, a friend who's turned on him. That turns up in in a psalm, by the way, that's talking about Ahithophel, but is looking toward Judas. He then gives advice, and along this time, trying to find out what are we going to do, he sends back a friend to try to handle it. He comes out, Ziba, who is Mephibosheth's servant, and Mephibosheth is the son of Saul that David helped, was very uh, friendly toward David. Ziba lies about Mephibosheth to get his stuff, but it's, David doesn't know this. So then he feels like everybody's turned against him, Mephibosheth has turned against him. He then comes out of the city, chapter 16, and verse 5, and runs into Shimei, who is cursing him. Shimei is related to all the things going back to Saul. And in the meantime, Ahithophel is giving advice to Absalom. Well, what we find in the process of time, I want us to come back and look at verse 14 of chapter 16. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. So Shimei has been cursing him, and he's just letting it, he's basically telling them to let it go, don't, don't respond, don't do anything. But right along that hillside, he's throwing stones, he's just being a pest, and they stop, they're just worn out. And I would suggest to you that this is the time frame in the background for Psalm 3, where we now turn. Psalm 3 is the first psalm that gives us a specific heading and a description when it says, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. 
in the things that we noted as we went through, I wanted to remind you of the situation so you can appreciate the mindset of David and the wording that he uses and he selects because it's important. So we want to read the whole of the psalm. It's only eight verses long, and then we'll go through and notice it. So hopefully you'll notice some things in the process just based upon that background. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. So if we go back through and take a look at the progression of the psalm, I want you to see that he is... He refers to his situation. And the first thing I want you to note is numbers. That's a key thing as you see throughout this psalm. When he says how they have increased, and we saw that term used in Samuel. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there's no, no help for him in God. And that was something actually that was specifically uh, said as, as he was leaving. And then you come down in his statement, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. So the one thing I want you to see from the outset is that the idea of numbers is key to understanding and appreciating the, the full picture of this psalm. And that's why we needed to go back and look at what had happened. Here we have, and keep this in mind, the king. You have the person who is the king, and yet he has lost the support of his people. This is a coup. So Absalom has gone through, and he's taking four years to build up support internally behind the scenes throughout all of Israel. He carefully made sure to involve, take 200 people who are close. Why? Because they were innocent. They didn't know anything about it, but he's doing this for appearances' sake. To make it appear like even these people have turned on you, David. He is putting all of this forward with his plan. He's got the plan in place. He goes down to Hebron because that's where David began his reign. Symbolism. And then he comes back and, and he has this statement about he's now reigning. Why? Because that's how you made this announcement. And it happens simultaneously, essentially, all across the country. And David, the warrior, now keep this in mind, the greatest warrior Israel ever knew. Fleas. Why? I think we can see two different major reasons I want you to think about and then as we look at the psalm. Number one, this is his son. This is his son. And no matter what Absalom has done, you consistently see that David does not want to fight him. David knows his background, his, his life warring, and his faith is strong. His faith is what in battle had given him victories. But he did not want to do that himself. Now he's older now too, and, and, and that plays into this. But you go on, you say, the nature of the faith is such that as he has grown, he is giving it not just faith to go into battle himself, but the faith not to go into battle. And I want you to think about why that's important for us. We can go through and we see multiple times where we have the imagery of having the faith to go into battle. 
And sometimes we need faith not to. And that itself is important for the context of this psalm. But this whole mass of the idea of people, your own people, so when it says increase, we, we, we forget. If we don't put this in the right context, we can say, oh, this is massive armies. When he talks about all these people who have increased who trouble him, he's talking about his own people turning against him. The increase, to see people out, all, all of a sudden just kind of come up. And apparently they don't believe in you anymore. They don't care. They've forgotten everything you've done in the past. And they're willing to throw you off the throne. The numbers. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Now, whenever you see a repetition, especially in the Psalms, because you're talking about poetic language, the, the nature of Hebrew poetry, but, but actually any time in Scripture when you see a repetition, uh, you need to look at the differences because that tells you really what the, the key elements are, what you're learning. So as he looks down and he is talking about the increased who have troubled, he describes them as trouble me, rise up against me, and say of me. Now, I don't know how many times you've run into this kind of thing. We're going to try to keep it on a personal level too because this is both a nationwide problem, but it's also a very personal issue for David. And he presents it as a personal thing for him in this psalm. So if you've ever had an issue where it felt like everybody was against you, could be at work, could be that family issues sometimes can come up. It could just be in the culture itself that you feel like the outsider insider problem that kind of thing but where they've got it at, they've got it in for you rise up against you and the key element as he ends is he's kind of moving up and, and strengthening each time they've increased they rise up against and then they say this the audacity to say there is no help for him in god God won't help him. Basically, it's the idea of God's left him the same way he left Saul. God's not helping him anymore. Now think about that as being said. Not have any help. How do you react? And that is the key to the psalm. How do you react in those situations? Everything's against you. Your kingdom's gone. You've lost essentially everything you worked for your entire life. Gone. And you leave it. You're not there fighting for it. We, our first thing is we're going to fight for it. He leaves it. And verse 3 is why. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. People said that God had left David. You know, sometimes that's a way to try to break your faith too. In terms of what other people try to tell you about God. They try to get their opinion in about what God is toward you. God doesn't care about you. God doesn't do this. God is a loving, he's not doesn't care about these issues, whatever. But he, they want to get their opinion in. It's a trying to break your faith so that you will not act and oppose them. The statement of verse 3 is a contrast to the end of verse 2. Here's what people say. Here's the reality. So whatever people said, so in a sense when he says, whatever people say God has left David, David never left God. He knew better. And he states it in three ways. And this also has a strengthening effect as you go when you look at the words. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory, 
and the one who lifts up my head. Now, these three I want you to consider again as, as moving forward as a, as a, with a crescendo effect. Because what he is doing is saying, first of all, what does a shield do? What's the purpose of a shield? Protect, right? You, something you can get behind, as a, as a matter of fact, the, the nature of it when it says for me is, is to cover. And some, I think some translations kind of expand upon the word there to indicate it. But it's the shield is protect. Here everybody is against me. God's not. Quite to the contrary, God will protect me. I have faith that God will protect me despite all of this. So the numbers don't matter. God will protect me. Now when you get an idea of a shield, usually as a soldier, you get into a, a kind of a hunkered down position. You think about when you run into problems, don't we, don't we use, I don't know if y'all use the term hunker down, right? If y'all don't know what that means, that means when that tornado is coming, you hunker down, right? You, why you want to get as small as possible, you want to where the fewest things can hit you, you get down. That's what you do with that shield. So you get behind the shield so nothing coming in. So it's, it's, a, it's a frightened and yet secure kind of position. So you make yourself small and you get down, but you're going to hide behind. He's my shield. But to say that God is my glory is a very different thing. And it's such a big word to be put right here. When we use the word glory, you hear the word glory, what are we usually thinking of? Heaven? There's a reason for that in the New Testament. It often refers to resurrection, of what the great thing God can do. You see that numerous times because greatness is part of what this word's about. Reputation of greatness. Now, when you take it that way, remember David is king, who is essentially being overthrown. What did he care about as far as his reputation was? God's reputation. Any greatness David achieved to this point, the, really this high point for, for Israel, maybe not politically that and wealth, that expanded under Solomon, but he made it all possible. And here he is at this point, and it's not about him Even in the moment in which he's being overthrown, it is not about him. You know how many times the problem comes up, whether we're talking about world leaders, CEOs, or just normal guy? It's when it becomes about us. Because then we will start doing all sorts of things to protect my reputation and protect my territory, my turf. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, anybody been involved in a turf war or seen them at work? Okay, y'all don't have to raise your hand. Turf wars happen in the church too. Shouldn't. Because it's about God. And David accepted it being about God. He accepted it was about God. And you're going to see that when you, you see what he said in response to Shimei, who you have to understand, remember, is throwing rocks at him. Shouting at him, calling him all sorts of names. Basically saying, you deserve every bit of this. And he says, leave him alone. Let God decide whether or not I ever, it's up to God whether I ever turn my throne. Maybe he's right. my glory and then he adds the third part and the one who lifts up my head now remember the situation that david is in 
He's been run out of his own house, his own capital. Is that kind of a depressing thought? Is it humiliating? Would you say that when they were coming, going out of Jerusalem and marching through the valley, because you have to go through this when you're going through Jerusalem, you're going down, it talks about being on the Mount of Olives, and you're going around, and, and some have even said perhaps this was where it was. We're not sure exactly along this pathway where he would have used this. And you get out, you think they'd be walking out as soldiers? Or you think that everyone, family included, is kind of dragging their feet a little bit? Which one do you think it was? You kind of look down, just one foot in front of the other, having to leave. And someone comes along, holds up your head. You have no reason to be ashamed. There are times in which we suffer setbacks. Personal setbacks, spiritual setbacks, setbacks for the work. And we fail to turn to God as our shield. We fail to remember that it's about Him. And we let those setbacks cause us to drop our head. We need to come back and remember when we've got our priorities in order then we can lift up our head and move forward even if it is running away. Verse 4, the answer. If he, God is at the center, then what was the natural thing that this will mean for God to be at the center? I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. Prayer. Prayer. If you're really going to turn to God, if you're truly still trusting in God, whatever they have to say doesn't matter. I'm still going to put this in God's hands. And this is important because in terms of the structure, he takes action. But for the solution, the first thing he chooses to do is pray. First. Because of verse 3. Verse 3 is what makes verse 4 possible. If you don't have an attitude of verse 3, you don't get to verse 4. I cried to the Lord with my voice. I prayed my heart out. And he heard me from his holy hill. Now this is important. What was the holy hill? What is that a reference to in terms of imagery? To Zion. Where was Zion? Jerusalem, what was on Zion? City of David, palace, and the ark. Whatever Absalom is doing, whatever they've said about Absalom, you still reign, God. You see, it doesn't matter if I don't reign. Because God reigns. And the imagery of this, which is, of course, looking up to the idea of where God would be, his will going forth, Zion, his holy hill, is a representation of heaven, was important. So we have the problem, we have an attitude toward God, faith. Fully expressed deep within. And now we see what comes from that in verse 5. I lay down and slept. Now we're going to stop right there with the next part that's coming, but the situation that I described that we looked at in 2 Samuel of just getting out of town. The reason for that was the fear that Absalom was going to come in 
immediately with his army and kill everyone. That's how desperate this situation is. In the meantime, we're finding Ahithophel is telling Absalom to do exactly that, to pursue David. He's getting conflicting advice, which is partly by what David has tried to help with by sending someone back. He's getting this advice, and Absalom hesitates. And that's what allows time for them to get away. But David doesn't know that. He doesn't know what decision has been made. So I want you to imagine you have just heard that you've been overthrown. You have your family, your entire family essentially with you. Best friends, advisors, those loyal to you. And you are on barefoot now. This is not the retreat of a king on a horse. Barefoot, traipsing through the valley, up the mountain, on a hike to escape. And you are going to go as long as you possibly can until you are all exhausted. And now you stop But you think at the time there's a possibility that Absalom's army is on your heels. I lay down and slept. How in that kind of situation do you lay down and sleep? When times are hard, you ever had sleepless nights? One thing just consumes you and you cannot let go of it. Verses 3 and 4 are the reason David slept. Exhaustion part of it, I imagine too. But it's faith, I handed it over to God. David, in getting out of the city, going as far as he could, with as many as he could, had done everything he could. What then? You hand it over to God. Everything else is out of your control. You did what was in your control. Now you hand the rest over to God. I can't do anything more. He prays. And I sleep. Now what kind of faith does it take to do that? Because that's the faith we need to have. To do what we need to do in whatever situation, to do the right thing, to pray about it, and hand it over to God, and then sleep. Can't do anything more. Get some rest. In peace, accept whatever may be, because you trust God will handle it. And whatever that ends up being is okay. That doesn't mean it's going to be good for you. Yes, sir. Yes. No. I, th- I think that's right. As you, you were saying that you need to go back and look at times at which you've done the right thing and God's blessed you and, you've, and that that success ought to build your confidence in go- moving forward. And that, that has to, for some people, it has to begin sometime. David, it began with uh, bears and lions in a field. When he was a boy. It, it led him at around age 17 to be willing to face Goliath, and then after that to deal with all the problems of Saul. And here he is older, it hasn't ever changed. And he's drawing on that faith. And David's faith grows in different ways, same way as Abraham's faith does through his life. Uh, both great examples of that. And that's why I think it's interesting that he gets to the point here where he, his faith makes it possible for him not to fight. Well, 
you see the next part when it says, I lay down and slept, the next part of verse 5 is important. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. Well, what does that mean? No one killed me in my sleep. I made it to another day. You know, sometimes making it to the next day is a great success. When you are in the middle of going through just a lot of stress, uh, it, could, it could be just stress from work, it could be uh, pro- problems, it, it could be uh, illness, it could be mourning, it could be just all the things, lots of things going on that are problems. It could be issues with the kids. You're just trying to get to the next day. And that's what he's saying. I made it. I woke up. God took care of me for another day. And sometimes we need to go back to this instead of thinking that, you know, whenever I pray, God give me a long life, we need God give me tomorrow. And it's the difference in the perspective is important. And then verse 6, which is what we tend to memorize or remember from this, you would have the, the song that comes from this. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Now, this I want you to put in the context, especially with the comment just made. Because essentially what he has done is he made the decision to stop, exhausted, we're going to stop, and we're going to trust whatever it may be. Sleep. Awake. What conclusion do I draw from this? Oh, no big deal. No, no, no. It was still a big deal. But the bigger deal was God sustaining me. The conclusion was not, Absalom's not a problem. The conclusion was, God sustained me through the problem. And because he sustained me that one night, he then in verse 6 here is giving confidence that he will, God will continue to do that. It's a confidence builder for himself. We made it this far. We can keep on going. I will not be afraid. There's also an implication in that. Was fear very natural in this circumstance? Maybe there had been some fear. I will not be afraid. You know, there there are... Different pe- people are scared by different things. Um, I think about, you know, I've been my, on my mind as I'd watch, you know, we were in a very, an area completely unaffected this past week up in the Northeast. And w- but I'd get up and I'd watch every day and every night, it probably annoyed Tracy, but I would turn on and I would check the weather. I wanted to see what was going on, on pe- where people were that I knew and loved. I wanted to check on them. And so I'd, I'd watch and check and th- think about the fear that comes from that. Or the, the fear that comes from, I don't know if anybody's ever had your, your life actually threatened. Um, that happened to me years ago in, in a, a hold-up kind of situation. Yeah, don't recommend that. Um, but you go through and you say, you evaluate and you say, I got through this. I will not be afraid. If you have the perspective of what matters is God's will, not mine, that whatever I have, it doesn't matter as long as I'm right with God. See, I I think what we tend to do, though, is I'm fine if I got through as God's will as long as I got a little bit of what I wanted to. But we have to be fine with it if I lose everything, as David essentially has here. I've lost everything. And I'll be fine even if I'm going to lose my life over it, if I'm right with God. That in the end, that's the one thing that matters. Not I'm right with God and I have stuff. Not I'm right with God and I've got all these other things to do. That I'm right with God. And so he says, verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. Now remember what they'd said? God's not with you. 
God's not with David. And what does that night's rest, prayer, faith, and confidence do? You take care of this for me. Arise. Arise. What what kind of terminology is arise? Get up. It's it's also often a, a military term. Arise. Save me, oh my God. Let's get going. This is something that we, you would say, if you were the commander, it would be one of those four. Everyone up and over. But the call is out to God. David doesn't have the army to do anything, but he does have God. And he has confidence that God can do the job. Save me, oh my God. Why? For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. And of course, the imagery he is putting forth here is just a huge hit across the face. And he is saying, all my enemies, you've basically given the, the final decisive blow. You are the one who has done that. All of the enemies, and you go back and you look at everybody that David had defeated. And he says, you did that. And if you did that, you can handle this. Going back to your point. And therefore he concludes, salvation belongs to the Lord. It's not up to me to preserve me. I need to do whatever God says. I need to be wise, but it's, in the end, it's not going to be up to me if I continue to reign or if I continue to live. All of that is up to the Lord, and I leave it up to him because he can handle it, he knows best. And then this last phrase, your blessing is upon your people. Whenever you see the change in the pronouns, pay close attention. It's about the Lord David, Lord David, Lord David, and then he says, Your blessing, Lord, is upon your people. Now, David is king. Whose people is this? It's God's people. He's saying, you will do right. You will do what's best for your people. I have confidence you will do what's best for your people, and I'm good with that. even if that means I'm not king. Take care of me. Save me. You have it within you. Now, whatever kind of situation we may face in life, and it's not going to be like David. I I hate to disappoint you. I don't see any world leaders sitting here. But whatever situations we face, stress, adversity, hardship turn to psalm 3 turn to psalm 3 it doesn't matter what other people say it doesn't matter matter how far you fall in worldly terms if your faith in god is strong and you put everything in making sure you're right with him that you just let go do what you're supposed to do let go pray about it move forward with confidence in him and always recognizing he's going to do what's right, you will come out on the other side stronger for having done so, and everything will be worked out in the end. Doesn't mean you get back what you had. Doesn't mean that everything is good in worldly terms. It means it's fine if you have a spiritual point of view. David was a fantastic man of faith. He did not get there overnight, though. But we see on this one overnight how far he came. Appreciate your attention.